So welcome back. This is our last class of this mitochondrial bioenergetics course. And here I want to talk about mitochondrial oxidant, also known as reactive oxygen species generation, and also about mitochondrial antioxidant capacities. Now, when we talk about reactive oxygen species or free radicals or oxidants in mitochondria, often we think this is a very modern science and that we're looking at redox signaling just in the last few years. But nothing could be more different from reality. In fact, we've known that mitochondria generate hydrogen peroxide since the mid-1960s. And in the early 1970s, pioneers in the field, such as Britton Chance and Alberto Boveris, actually described most of the characteristics of mitochondrial oxygen, uh, oxidant generation that we know today to be true. So how mitochondrial oxidant generation is determined by different respiratory rates or how different sites within the mitochondrial electron transport chain generate oxidants. We're going to talk a little bit about that uh, later on in this class. Uh, finally, also Angela Azi, who was very active in the field until today, described in 1975 that mitochondria generate superoxide radicals. And you have to really admire that because we're talking about free radical generation in a biological system that's not easy to detect. And they actually found these superoxide radicals as the source of most of the hydrogen peroxide that is generated secondarily to the superoxide radical in mitochondria. So remember the people who really worked in the field earlier than all of us. So what kind of oxidants can you see in mitochondria? So very classically, we know that the electron transport chain can generate superoxide radicals. Um, superoxide radicals typically are not found to be produced from mitochondrial complex 4. Mitochondrial complex 4 is very specialized in the reduction of oxygen to water, and it does not unbind these partially reduced intermediates that you produce when you're reducing oxygen to water. So it really uh, binds them very strongly, and you don't have much superoxide production there. But the other more early complexes of the respiratory chain components of the electron transport chain can reduce oxygen with one electron and generate superoxide radicals. And this production of superoxide radicals, depending on where it happens in the electron transport chain, can actually produce superoxide radicals towards the intermembrane space or towards the mitochondrial matrix. Now, there are other sources of mitochondrial oxidants which are often overlooked, and I really think you have to think about um, because we should be talking more about these sources. They're very important functionally. An example that I give you here is alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase is a flavoenzyme. It's a matrix enzyme and part of the Krebs cycle, and it's a very important source of mitochondrial superoxide radicals. Typically, flavoenzymes can generate superoxide radicals, and they will generate more of these radicals when there's less NAD in the oxidized form for them to reduce. So the production of superoxide by these flavoenzymes in mitochondria is stimulated by lack of oxidized NAD. Uh, in addition to alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, there are other flavoenzymes in mitochondria that can also generate superoxide. Don't forget about them and just think about the electron transport chain. So superoxide radicals, as we will see later, can be dismutated and produce hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is the main oxidant we detect as a symbol of mitochondrial oxygen generation. And the reason we prefer to detect hydrogen peroxide is because it's much more stable and also membrane permeable, so you can detect hydrogen peroxide produced in mitochondria from the outside of mitochondria. So peroxides have been around for most of evolution, and we have very efficient mechanisms to remove this hydrogen peroxide. And the reason we must remove hydrogen peroxide is that if it accumulates in the presence of iron, it can generate through the Fenton reaction hydroxyl radicals. And hydroxyl radicals are extremely reactive radicals, therefore damaging typically radicals. Um, they're very hard to detect in biological systems, but we do have evidence through modification of biological components that hydroxyl radicals are generated in mitochondria.
In addition to these oxygen, reactive oxygen species, um, nitric oxide has been found in mitochondria. Now, some authors have found evidence for nitric oxide synthases present in mitochondria, while other authors question the presence of nitric oxide synthases in mitochondria. Independently, if nitric oxide is produced within mitochondria or not, nitric oxide is produced in cells, and it's very diffusible and quite stable. So nitric oxide is definitely present in mitochondria, even if it's not produced in mitochondria. And nitric oxide, in the presence of superoxide, can generate peroxynitride, which is a very reactive species, and it, there's evidence that it has been produced, that it is produced in mitochondria. So mitochondria have many different types of oxidants within them. And one point I want to make about oxidants is that people often talk about reactive oxygen species or oxidants as a single chemical entity. But in reality, oxidants are very diverse in their reactivity and therefore very diverse in their function. So I want to stimulate you from now on to not think of them as a single chemical entity and actually remember that they're very different molecules that are oxidants and very different in their properties. And I really like in the sense the speedometer that uh, Ohara Augusta put in her book about free radicals, which exemplifies how different free radicals can be. So we don't have other oxidants here, just free radicals. But we start with very, very slow molecules, such as molecular oxygen that we breathe. Oxygen is a biradical, and yet we all live with oxygen. We all need oxygen to function. Um, nitric oxide is also quite a slow radical, and it's a radical that is very linked to signaling processes because it has slow reactivity. On the other hand, when you go to the other end of the spectrum where you have hydroxyl radical or carbonate radicals that are very, very reactive radicals, look how many orders of magnitude more reactive they are than the slower radicals, really reactive radicals. These tend to be species that are more associated with damage to tissues and not signaling processes. So we do have to keep in mind what kind of molecule we're talking about so that we can think of the possible functions of these molecules and also the kinds of modifications that they can promote. Oxidants are not all the same molecule. Now, having said that, oxidants are not all the same molecule, but they have been around since the beginning of life. So there's evidence of the presence of antioxidants in all groups of living beings on Earth today. And that means that the last universal common ancestor from which we all descend already had antioxidant systems. And that means that we always have had oxidants around us, and therefore we've always been adapted to use these oxidants. We use these oxidants as signaling molecules, and we also use these oxidants as damaging molecules, and we are prepared to prevent these damaging effects of these molecules. Uh, and the first real evidence that oxidants were a normal part of life actually came in 1969 when McCord and Friedovich described the existence of superoxide dismutases. So this was a description of an enzyme that exists specifically to remove a free radical. And this is evidence, therefore, that living beings generate free radicals normally, and this is not just the effect of radiation or some kind of external damaging signaling um, effect in these, uh, in these living beings. So what do superoxide dismutases do? They catalyze the dismutation of superoxide radicals into hydrogen peroxide and oxygen. Mitochondria have superoxide dismutases. They were described in the early 1970s to have manganese SOD in the mitochondrial matrix. In the early 2000s, we also found that mitochondria also have copper-zinc superoxide dismutase in the intermembrane space. And it's important to have superoxide dismutases in both spaces because we generate superoxide on both sides of the inner mitochondrial membrane and superoxide is poorly permeable to the membrane. So you have to remove superoxide on both sides of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Manganese superoxide dismutase is extremely important. Knockout animals do not survive unless you add a mimetic of superoxide dismutase, such as manganese TBAP, back into these animals 
to make up for this lack of superoxide dismutase activity in the mitochondrial matrix. So very important antioxidant system in mitochondria. Another mitochondrial antioxidant that people often don't think about is cytochrome C. So cytochrome C has a day job, which is transporting electrons between complex three and complex four. And that is a very important function of cytochrome C. But it's also a really interesting protein that has other functions, such as an antioxidant function. One property of cytochrome C is that in its oxidized form, it can actually receive electrons from superoxide radicals. And these superoxide radicals now reduce cytochrome C, and the reduced cytochrome C can actually feed these electrons back into complex four, back into the electron transport chain. So a really elegant way to rescue these electrons that were lost by reducing uh, oxygen to superoxide radicals. In addition to that, reduced cytochrome C can also act as an antioxidant and can remove hydrogen peroxide producing water. So this is really a protein in mitochondria that has many different functions, electron transport and removal of superoxide and hydrogen peroxide. Mitochondria can also remove hydrogen peroxide using catalase. Mitochondria from heart and liver have been shown to have catalase. In other tissues, the activity doesn't seem to be as high. But catalases also are thought to be important when concentrations of hydrogen peroxide are quite high. When concentrations are more low and perhaps more physiological, most hydrogen peroxide is removed by thiol-linked systems, um, such as thioredox and peroxidase reductase systems. So thioredox and peroxidase acts um, by using electrons from thioredoxin to remove uh, hydrogen peroxide generating water and oxidize thioredox. Now, if you have oxidized thioredox, then you have to reduce it once more so that the system can continue working. And there are second enzyme acts, which is thioredoxin reductase, reducing thioredoxin again and using electrons from NADPH. The system is very similar to the glutathione peroxidase reductase system, which is also present in mitochondria. So glutathione peroxidase uses electrons from two glutathione molecules to reduce glutathione molecules, produces water from hydrogen peroxide and oxidized glutathione. This oxidized glutathione is now recovered by glutathione reductase using electrons from NADPH. And this, of course, produces NADP in the oxidized form. So how does NADP in the oxidized form get reduced again so that both thioredoxin and glutathione peroxidase reductase systems can work? Mitochondria do not have the pentose pathway to produce NADPH. Instead, NADP can be reduced by some enzymes in the matrix. So isocitrate dehydrogenase and glutamate dehydrogenase can both reduce NAD, NADP, and, and NADP. So they can generate NADPH. But a really important source of NADPH in mitochondria is an enzyme called the mitochondrial transhydrogenase. And the transhydrogenase is really quite interesting because it uses electrons from NADH to reduce NADP. And typically this reaction wouldn't be thermodynamically favorable, but the transhydrogenase uses the electrochemical potential to make this reaction favorable. So the mitochondrial transhydrogenase is actually a transmembrane protein, an inner mitochondrial membrane protein, which allows the entry of a proton coupled to this transfer of electrons from NADH to NADP, generating NADPH. This means that it can generate NADPH in a manner dependent on the inner mitochondrial membrane potential. And this NADPH is now used to reduce either glutathione or thioredoxin and allow for the function of glutathione and thioredoxin peroxidase, removing hydrogen peroxide. Uh, the transhydrogenase is a really interesting enzyme because it allows the mitochondria to produce NADPH in a situation of high membrane potentials. And high membrane potentials, as we will see later, are actually the situation in which mitochondria produce more oxidants. 
So mitochondrial antioxidant capacity is actually higher with high membrane potentials, which are exactly the same situations in which mitochondria typically generate more oxidants. So the antioxidant system is beefed up under the same conditions in which mitochondria generate more oxidants. This is very elegant. Uh, the transhydrogenase is also really interesting because it's absent in an animal model that's very often used for studies, uh, and therefore it's something we have to think about when we're doing mitochondrial studies. We'll talk about it a little bit later. We'll talk about that a little later. So that's the part I wanted to tell you about what different oxidants we can detect in mitochondria and mitochondrial antioxidant systems. In the next video, I'll come back and talk about the general properties of how mitochondria generate oxidants. So till then.